staying connected. Most of us understand the importance of staying connected to those we love. And think of the technology that's available today to see, hear, and connect with family, friends, and business associates, no matter where they are in the world. We understand how important it is to connect, but do we remember those who came before? Do we understand the importance of connecting to those in our past, those on whose shoulders we stand? This History of the Saints special presentation is about staying connected to our heritage. The big problem we've got today is people are so busy. You've got so much social media. Everybody's got a cell phone. They've got so many things that can distract them from what really matters. What really matters is who are we? Where did we come from? Who are our forefathers? What price have they paid? I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for myself. I can say that I would not be uh, anywhere near as blessed as I am if I did not have forefathers that were among those pioneers that made those journeys. I have great grandparents that pulled hand carts. See, I'm 91 years old now. And the more I realize who I am in connection with who my forefathers are, I realize I have been abundantly blessed. And therefore, uh, hopefully, uh, um, in my efforts to try to give my best effort to protect and to educate and to make known the value of appreciating pioneers, our forefathers, from whatever lands they came, from whatever culture they came. And when we come to know who we are, we do everything we can to bless the lives of others like our lives have been blessed. So sacrifice, some people would say, is uh, is harder to do today than it was in the days of sacrificing everything to make the journey across the plains to come to the valley. We are not asked to do that, but we are asked to be engaged in good causes. We are asked to hold up uh, the hands that hang down. We are asked to be my brother's keeper. There are many places established around the world dedicated to remembering the lives, struggles, and triumphs of those who came before us. One of those treasure troves of precious memory is right here in Salt Lake City. This is the place, Heritage Park. Well, I think the one of the reasons that I love to come up here and why I'm devoted to this cause is because of the people who are the staff and the volunteers who serve up here. And invariably, when I meet people who have been to the park, uh, when they're leaving or even uh, days or weeks later, I'll say, what did you like about the park? And they just loved the, the, the workers up there and what a great attitude and how positive they were and how helpful. And so I think that, again, tries to be, that's an example of what we need and what is often missing in the world today that people can have a good time and uh, yet also learn principles. And this is not a religious uh, park. It is a park that tells a story of history and a, and a story of principles and values that are so missing and so needed in the world today. The pioneers came down Immigration Canyon. We've all heard the story about Brigham Young stopping and saying, this is the right place. But where was that precise spot where Brother Brigham declared, this is the right place? But there was never any marker or indication of where or what. And then finally, uh, in 1915, they decided to erect a, a marker up there. And so to find out where to put the marker, B.H. Roberts had been told by Wilford Woodruff the very spot where Brigham Young lifted up out of Wilford's 
carriage and said, this is the right place. And so that's the place they put this uh, marker, and it was a cross about eight feet tall. And uh, it said, this is the place, Brigham Young. That was the first marker here. That stood for six years, and then they took it down and built this obelisk, a white obelisk that still stands today, uh, which is on the spot where Brigham Young made that very prophetic statement. In 1947, this large and familiar monument was dedicated, and over time, the historical footprint of This is the Place Heritage Park grew in size and significance. So in 06, the, the desire was to build a park that would be very interesting for families to bring their, uh, their children to, but also uh, to bring visitors from the state so that they could understand how this state really got started. And so we started adding things to the park that would make it uh, more fun and more interesting. We added the Native American village with uh, Native American dancers, uh, a, a giant teepee. We end up with with about 60 buildings up here that uh, feature different st stories about the pioneers and how the, the life was back in those early days. But also we could see that uh, during that time, what we were doing was our, our attendance increased. But then we came to a couple of years ago when we felt like we also wanted to more accurately tell the, the really uh, heartwarming story of how the, why this was really important. And uh, I, I just think our history of America, the history of this whole Intermountain area, and the history of this, this is the place, Heritage Park, is something that when you stop and think about it, has to touch your heart. You can't do it and not feel something real deeply intimate. And then, you know, you start doing a little family history, and all of a sudden you get yourself connected to those who came before. And uh, I think that touches people's hearts. Well, no better place to feel that than right here, where you come where they came 150 plus years ago. Of all the meaningful places in this park, and there are many, there is one that is particularly compelling. It's this one, the Pioneer Children's Memorial. And so in a uh, visit with the leaders of the Days of 47, uh, Greg James had had this great idea that they should, there should be a monument up here, some way to honor the pioneer children who didn't make it on the uh, tr trail when the, during those pioneer times. Then the Pioneer Children's Memorial concept was born, and we started building that uh, a year ago in the fall, and that's what we have today that helps people really understand and feel what happened in those early days. That includes these beautiful giant stones that some of them weigh up to 10 ton with the names carved in of each of the children that uh, we're honoring. We knew we wanted to express a setting of the children, you know, be memorialized in some form. We knew we, we have already talked about Sweetwater Crossing, you know, the sense of the whacking and oxen and children and other coming, the hardship of coming across the, the water. And the other one we knew too was the, um, uh, the um, 
hand card, you know, from Rocky Ridge story are coming up. And so these started developing as two major ones. And then the uh, journey sand that we already have the sculpture piece for, and then the idea of some other pieces, um, uh, Ephraim Hanks and his story, and later on Joseph F. and his Ox and Tom. So all these ideas percolated up about telling this story. And all this really was concentrated around sculpture pieces. Uh, when they were telling me what they were going to do with that piece of real estate, and I thought, oh, how, do you, how are you going to do that going through all those trees? And, well, we've got, as you know, we've got uh, uh, Rocky Ridge, we've got uh, the river, we've got uh, uh, a feeling of the struggle of certain areas on the trail that the people went through, both with hand carts and with, uh, with wagons. So I think we can say today that that memorial is a great, um, probably a great uh, statement for the whole world as to what the price really was that our pioneer forefathers paid. Inside the Pioneer Children's Memorial are, note it, 47 remarkable pieces of sculpture, like this one right here in front of me, Bodie Mortensen from the Willie Handcart Company. The feeling of a struggle, the feeling of, you know, doing this in faith and in dedication to do this, and the hardship we want to express in the in each of the sculpture pieces. And I, I told them, I said, you know, the worst thing we can do is to have these kind of glorified faces, you know, pushing on, like, but they need to show their, their hardship, their frown, you know, their tears. So the expression of the statues became an expression of the faith and the hardship. For any of you who have been to Wyoming and possibly gone over Rocky Ridge, this recreation inside the Pioneer Children's Memorial is absolutely stunning. We thought originally some area, but they just caught on with it and there's a huge area where the rocks are literally buried in the ground, not just laid flat, but buried just like the Rocky Ridge was. We have pictures of it. We went and got the same kind of stone in Wyoming for it. And, and they really set off this sense of the uh, handcart. And the handcart was a special kind of creation of the women that had pulled this handcart and where they had some help to get over the ridge. I went through it so many times in its process uh, that every time I watched it or came close to it, I, I, uh, um, I had deep emotions. Uh, emotions of, um, in my own heart. And when we, for example, when we uh, got to the, uh, to the oxen, where Joseph F. Smith is. When I saw that, uh, I started to weep. You know, here is, here is a story of, of one of our prophets who at five stands and watches his father and his uncle Joseph ride off to Carthage. Five years old and next sees him with his father and Joseph in the mansion house after they had been martyred for the cause of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm connected to him through my mother. My mother's a Smith. And in fact, Joseph's oldest son was my grandfather. 
Ira Max Smith, who I never knew. He died in 1918 before I was born. So when we talk about pioneers and feelings and family and connections, I had it all. I get it every time I walk through that trail. But of course, it is these stones and sculptures that are at the center of the Pioneer Children's Memorial. And I started looking at these names of these children that I supplied for the, the monument and, and, and saw that there were 74 parents out of, this, out of the 690 or so names that of the children that I, that I had on there. 74 parents suffered a loss of more than one child. That, I, I, when I did this in, uh, compilation initially, I didn't have that kind of feeling, but then going back and looking at it, and then I put myself in the shoes of those parents, not just the ones, the ones who lost one child. Let's, Let's put this in, in perspective. You join the church, you're maybe in England, you join the church, you kind of get a little sense of what it's like to be a member of the church in England. You learn about the doctrine of gathering to Zion and that you, it's almost like a commandment, you need to come to Zion. And so they obey that call to come to Zion. And on the way there, they're young, they, they're, they're not, they haven't been in the church that long, but on the way there, they lose a child. A child dies on the way there. You can imagine their feelings. But there were 74 parents who lost not just one child, but more than one child coming. There were 17 parents who lost three children. Three children in their family died crossing the plains. I didn't even look at those who might have lost children on the ocean or, or in getting to the outfitting point. And there were three parents who lost four children crossing the plains. And then I, I thought, well, what, what did they feel like? Did they regret joining in the church? What happened to them after they got to Salt Lake? What happened to them after they got to Utah? Would, would they, did they become bitter? Did they leave? Did they leave the church? What a sacrifice. Uh, Mr. Shelton, his world was turned upside down. He lost three children crossing the plains. His wife died at the outfitting point before he even left to come to Utah. He still came on. He didn't, he didn't, thought he, he didn't go back home. He also lost a son at the outfitting point. He lost five people just in that span of a few months. His world was turned upside down. I thought if there's some way to create it, you come down the mountain like they had done, you come down to out of the canyon and kind of walk through some stones, canyons that we had created, and then you see the valley. That started this concept of having some massive stones as, um, as a way of ending the journey, as kind of simplifying the entry into the valley. And uh, that turned out to be these uh, 17 or 18 stones that is, you know, anywhere from seven to 10 feet tall. And uh, that created these series of walls that you kind of snake through. And on the walls was inscribed the names of children that have died on the trail. And then also later on, we decided we wanted to add some life to it, like some children, maybe some spirit from the old days playing and kind of walking around and children of today. But it was sort of like to bring some of those children into it and pointing on the stone or contemplating or playing with a, a toy just to make it a happy place together with being a place of memorial. You can't walk through those stones and look at all those names and not be touched. And you can't make that, that you can't make that, that hike up through those trees and not realize what a great blessing 
this park is. But the more you, time you spend here, I have come to believe that this is a very, very unique place and, and a very special place in the Lord's eyes because of what happened here. And therefore, when people come to this spot, and especially when they go through the Pioneer Children's Memorial, they will get the feeling that I have now have, that is that this is a, a part of history that not only is important as a historical part, but it's also important to learn the principles of life that are so, uh, frankly, missing today in today's world. And that's what we try to do. Uh, because I believe the day will come, and it's coming more rapidly, where when people come to Salt Lake City, one of the things that the bus drivers will say and the taxi cab drivers will say, and they're members of the church and even the citizens, regardless of their religious conviction, will say to their friends who come to visit here, one place you'll sure they must see why you're here, is this is the place, Heritage Park. It is our memories, yours and mine, individual and collective that define who we are. To not know your past, your heritage, is to lose a vital part of yourself. This is the place Heritage Park, and particularly the Pioneer Children's Memorial, exist as an opportunity to connect with our past, with our ancestors, and with our heritage. Now, I say our, because after the Pioneer Children's Memorial was built, I discovered this name. William Morgan Miles died on the plains, buried next to the Platte River, and my second great uncle. There's an opportunity here for everyone to connect. I'm Glenn Rawson, and thank you. <laughs>